So I was actually at McDonald's for the first time in like a long time, but you know, it was just like desperate, there's nothing around. So some kid left his Happy Meal there and, and like, and it was on the side there and I saw the toy there in there. So I actually grabbed in and this thing's like a weapon. So it's like a, it's, it's almost like a, I don't know, it's like a, some sort of Batman like spear thing there. So let's see if we can give it to the audience. Welcome to Section 420, Talking Yankees. Well, that's the end of an era. Longtime Yankees broadcaster John Sterling officially retires. News kind of sudden then, and even though right, you know, it's been around a couple of weeks already, but we'll kind of dedicate most of this episode to John Sterling because, you know, he's kind of been the, really the face of the Yankees, at least the broadcast part of it, uh, for about four decades now. So we'll kind of go over John Sterling's career, probably a little some things you don't know about him, really kind of where he got started, his impact on the New York Yankees, you know, in this modern era, and kind of guess what they'll be doing against the Yankee broadcast in the short term uh, to replace him for the rest of the season and who may be there moving forward for the years to come. But So a lot of this will be about John Sterling, but of course we got the current Yankees as well and a couple of concerns, uh, mainly with the captain Aaron Judge, what's up with him? Not really getting off to a great start to the season. Yeah, he bopped a few home runs, but we'll look at his situation. As well as another struggling Yankee, Gleyber Torres, who I mentioned that at some point might lose his uh, leadoff hitter position. Well, he kind of did that already, and now it looks like he might lose some playing time, uh, you know, being relegated to the bench a little bit perhaps. So we'll kind of look at both their situations and which one I think would be bounced back. Plus, we have some other news. You know, MLB not so happy with the Nesta Cortez pump fake there, so he kind of got the finger wagged at him. Kind of give you that background story if you haven't heard it. As well as some comments by Michael Kay uh, recently on the trip up to Toronto, uh, kind of making some allegations about the Toronto Blue Jays, kind of how they're so much different at home versus away, and there's been some allegations, and this has been going on for a couple of years there, so we'll kind of give that backstory if you didn't hear the broadcast on that, so we got a lot of good stuff for this episode, but again, mainly it's going to be about John Sterling, uh, the voice of the Yankees, uh, big loss again, uh, calling it quits here in 2024, so a lot will be dedicated to him, but of course we have current Yankee news as well, so a lot of stuff for you, a lot of cool things, and I gave my comments on John Sterling a little bit earlier, so if you're an audio podcast subscriber, you've probably gotten that already, so that's why you should do if you haven't done it already. Wherever you get your favorite podcast, look for Section 420 Talking Yankees. Look for something that says follow, like, subscribe, like that. Mainly the, the subscribe and follow is the ones you want. You get notified when new episodes go there. Again, um, you know, that, that's content you can't get here or anywhere else. So make sure you're an exclusive podcast subscriber. And of course, if you're watching here on the YouTube channel or if you're watching on television, make sure you also subscribe here on YouTube if you haven't done it well. Section 420 Talking Yankees, you want to cover all the bases. So April 7th, the Sunday game against the Toronto Blue Jays at home. Now at the time, what we wouldn't know, but that would actually be the final uh, game for John Sterling to call for the New York Yankees shortly after that. You heard there was like a press announcement that he was going to, you know, going to kind of make some sort of statement or something. And you were like, hmm, what could this be? Now, initially, when I heard that news, I figured, all right, maybe at worst, he was just going to put a statement out there like, hey, this is going to be my final season and now the end of it. And we kind of saw that, you know, in years past, like when Mar Mariano Vera did that, held a little press conference, you know, in his final season during that spring training there. Uh, you know, Gita did some, something similar to that. But so you figure at anything you announce your time, you know, just sort of like, all right, this is probably it. So let me sort of announce it there. But John Sterling actually went one step further than that. He just ripped the Band-Aid right off and just, uh, just uh, announced that he was, that was going to be his final game and was going to retire after that. So... Now, again, overall, it shouldn't be a big surprise. You know, over the past you know, few seasons, he has taken a reduced role, especially when the you know, team's been on the road like that. So he has been kind of been winding it down a little bit. And again, he did a, you know, recently uh, an interview with The Athletic where he said it is coming to an end. So again, this all shouldn't be a really surprise to people. But it is kind of weird that you kind of do this midway as the season already started. I mean, you would think of anything, he would at least go through the final season or this is something he would announce even before the start of spring training, where, where it's like, you know, I'm not getting, you know, even, even get started here. So um, a little sudden that way, a little different that way, but I guess, you know, at 85 years old, I mean, he's getting up in there in years. And I just kind of think he looked at the situation where, you know, he started the season, he said, oh my God, you know, it's only April. I still got like five more months of this. Do I really want to do this? And I guess if it's just not there and, if you, and you're trying to perform as a broadcast, I mean, yeah, he's broadcast game, but it is a performance. I mean, you have to be into it. You have to be excited. And if he feels he just can't bring it, he's just not going to be into it and stuff like that. And you just want to, hey, look, let me just end it so, we don't, you know, I don't go out ugly. 
I guess that's just the decision way he wanted to do it. Now, supposedly he did have talks with the WFA and Brass there that possibly even taking a further reduced role. There was even that that pass they might even let him, you know, call games from home, which is kind of, you know, they were kind of doing during COVID a little bit there. So that was an option for him. But even with that with him, he just didn't like the idea, frankly, of just having to be there somewhere at a certain time. I mean, he just pretty much wanted nothing to do with anything in terms of uh, having the you know, having sort of responsibility, have some sort of time uh, scheduling like that. So um, even though maybe this fan was trying to squeeze one more year out of him, he was just frankly done there. Now, you heard some articles out there that maybe he might have some health concerns or some health issues, but really, according to Sterling, as he mentioned, he was just pretty much just done. I mean, as he said, he was on the radio since 1960, been broadcasting various different areas since 1964, and he just had enough. Um, it pretty much is that, that simple. Um, he also did, a, you know, of course, you know, he did an appearance on the Evan and Tiki show on the fan there. And he just, you know, just kind of told a story that is pretty much, you know, he was just basically, frankly, tired there. So in that, in that regard there, then I'm happy it's nothing health rela- uh, related there. It's just, frankly, he just, you know, just didn't want to work it anymore. And it all just makes kind of sense that, uh, there. And even, even refer- reference that, you know, you maybe only, he, you know, could almost point the blame that to last, uh, last year's Yankees who didn't even make the playoffs because, because of that. Well, he had a long off season than he normally would. Uh, he had all of October, all of November, all of December, all of January, all of February, and then maybe start, you know, getting into spring training mode there in March. But that's like five or six months of, of not working at all. And, I, and according to him, you know, that kind of got his appetite of, hey, I like not working. I like being retired. I like not having responsibility for stuff like that. So let me just do that the whole way. So kind of funny that just the way that things work that where let's say if Yankee last year's Yankee team made a little bit further run there into the postseason, maybe, you know, not say go to the World Series there, but maybe, maybe had him work into, into late October a little bit. Well, he probably would have had a, a shorter off season then. And then maybe, you know, him getting back to work a little bit sooner than normal, maybe it would put the idea of retirement out of his head or maybe at least for another year there. So, you know, you could somewhat blame the last season of the Yankees team, but a lot of it's circumstantial. But overall, he did kind of announce that, like, overall, you know, he was looking to wind his career down. And he kind of said, at some point, it was really coming to an end. So, you know, I thought maybe at least give this the, the one more year where he would kind of have his farewell tour. Like I said, you know, he does have a reduced, he doesn't go on as many road games as he normally do. And then, of course, they had his backups, Justin Schachter, as well as Emmanuel Babari, who they're pretty much going to, those two will probably carry the, the load the rest of the way for this season there. So, but at least John Surley, you know, you, you, you know, he's been broke as a long time. He's kind of, you know, at least the voice of the Yankees. You at least hope it would be nice if him had gone around at maybe some road games there, just sort of give his goodbye, get his accolades, get his hoopla. You know, we saw the farewell toe with Mariano Rivera. Uh, we saw the farewell toe with Derek Jeter. Even some like David Ortiz, you know, even though he's a hated rival, come to Yankee Stadium and, you know, kind of getting a hand there before the game and getting a present and stuff like that. You know, I think Sterling does deserve that because I'm not saying he's bigger than the game, but he is one of the big pieces of the game. And has been, of course, again, the voice of the New York Yankees, you know, kind of at least the top organization there, at least historically. Um, but I guess Sterling just didn't want the attention, didn't want all that stuff. So I guess he just ripped, like I said, just ripped the Band-Aid right off right away. And maybe he just didn't want that attention. So, again, 85 years old, been around for a while. So if that's the way he wants to go out, then uh, I guess that's, what, that's the way uh, he wants to do it. Now, the Yankees did have a ceremony for him. That was the uh, Saturday, the 20th game uh, against Tampa Bay. That was a Aaron had a bobblehead doll game there, so uh, they, you know, they at least gave uh, Sterling his his due in front of the Yankee Stadium crowd. And I guess for Sterling, that's good enough for him. Uh, but again, I think he does deserve to get a little bit more round baseball in general. But again, that I guess he doesn't want to travel anymore at all. Uh, so as I mentioned in the in the near term, as we've seen in the past, you know, you have Emmanuel Babari as well as Justin Schachtel probably going to pick up the load for him. Susan's still going to be there. Uh, we don't know what the future brings there. So you know, uh, I don't know if how long Susan's want, want to go there because kind of the two of them was paired. You know, maybe just not having Sterling there anymore. But maybe it's going to feel weird for her. So we'll see. You know, I don't think she's made really any comment either way there. Uh, but again, she's been around for a while. So now we look back at Sterling's career. Now, uh, obviously, with the New York Yankees, he's been with them since 1989 uh, until now. There, so you know, you're looking at 36 seasons. Uh, but again, he's, as I mentioned, he's been broadcasting long before that. Now, professionally, he actually cut his teeth. Um, now, you might expect this uh, with the NBA franchise, the Baltimore Bullets. Now, later on, to become the Washington Bullets uh, later on, but actually, originally they were the Baltimore Bullets back in 1970s for the so for the 70-71 season. So again, he's been doing this for a while. And but he's also broadcasting for other sports, other teams. Uh, did games for the, the New Jersey Nets, um, um, the Atlanta Hawks, the New York Islanders, as well as the Atlanta Braves, and then eventually uh, came to the Yankees uh, in 1989. Now, overall, you want to look at his uh, uh, stats here, number of games, 5,420. So, hey, we got a 420 in there. Uh, total regular season games for John Sterling, 
211 playoff games. Again, that was mainly back in, you know, back in the late 90s and at least 2000s when the Yankees were pretty much in the playoffs all the time there. And, of course, uh, five total World Series cha uh, cha uh, championships there, uh, certainly called that. And he had a bit of a Luke Gehrig Ironman streak in him, at least on the broadcast side of that. So he had a streak there that went from September 1989 to July 2019. Uh, so it looked like, like about 30 years there, streak there of calling games. And that, get, that was 5,060 uh, straight games there until he finally took a day off. Um, and I remember at the time it was like such a big thing. And it probably caused his lasting impression on the New York Yankees. I guess will be number one, the Yankees win, the Yankees win after each Yankee win. And of course, you know, the customized home run call for each Yankee player. Uh, so those are probably the two things he's most known for, you know, not just for, in, uh, for the New York Yankees, for Yankee fans, but all across baseball. And it kind of morphed a little bit, like he kind of started doing it in the late 90s and early 2000s. I guess some of the early ones was called Burn Baby Burn uh, with, for Bernie Williams and El Capitan for Jeter. Then, of course, you know, you got a little bit later, the Giambino for Jason Giambi. Uh, and then from there, I think, it, it, you know, so he would only do it for like two or three players at a time there. And then it just came to a point where that just, you know, evolved, where then he had to have a home run call for every single player. And it, it became like almost a gimmick, almost like the past 10 years in baseball. Even if it was like, a, you know, you would say like a, a backup player or a bench player, you would just wait, all right, until this person hits a home run, what's the sterling call going to be for this guy, you know? Uh, so he would, you know, every, every, almost every player had a, st a sterling call, so to speak. So, you know, that just kind of became a gimmick overall. At that. So that was, you would see those probably his two lasting uh, impressions on the um, Yankee or, um, organization there. So, and it, in itself, I remember, Early 2000s, I met him. So back when, you know, Michael K, before Michael K started doing TV, when Michael K and Sterling were paired up doing the radio broadcast, I actually met both of them down in Baltimore. And they were both nice enough to sign an index card for me. So I do have an official John Sterling uh, autograph there. So, you know, it's going to be a little different. You know, we've seen, again, over the past couple of seasons, we've seen games there where, you know, Sterling's on the radio. So it does feel kind of weird. Uh, but again, uh, but I guess now it's official, so he's not going to be there anymore. And I know some people have complained about him in recent years where, you know, especially with some of the home run calls, you know, he would say he would, he would make it sound like the ball is about to go over, at, at, over the fence, but, you know, it's just like a, a deep fly. Uh, we've also seen periods where he doesn't even give the score, you know. Now, I think a lot of it, that, well, that's a broadcaster technique to keep you, you know, listening to the game versus if he keeps giving the score every 15 seconds, well, you're going to just change the channel there. So I've heard some complaints like that about, about Sterling overall, but it seems overall he's just kind of a character guy, um, you know. Uh, you know, he's just kind of a chummy guy. Even if he blew some calls there, even if you kind of go through long periods of not giving a score there, it's kind of annoying there. But, you know, the one thing I think even opposing fans could, you know, like about Sterling, he wasn't a total homer. Yeah, you know, he's calling for the Yankees. You know he's rooting for the Yankees and he grew up a Yankee fan. But he wasn't a total homer like that. You know, he would criticize the Yankees if they need to be criticized. You know, he would have some excitement in his voice even if an opposing player hit a home run or big home run, even something that hurt the Yankees. He would at least give that player some equal enthusiasm to the other side. Uh, he wouldn't like root for a ball to go over the wall if it got hit by a Yankee there. He was kind of called down the line there. So, yeah, you knew he was the Yankee announcer, but he wasn't a total homer. And I don't know if you listen to some announcers from other organizations like the White Sox or the, the Braves. I mean, it's just disgusting how much, you know, just how biased they are against their home team. Yeah, you all, you can understand a broadcast wanting to root for his home team there, but you at least want to seem objective to a degree. But, you know, Sterling was very fair in that regard. Even Susan Waldman is. I mean, she, she'll criticize the Yankees more than anybody, uh, and she's not also a, a total homer. But you listen, like, again, some of those White Sox announcers there. You know, a White Sox player could hit a ball, and they're, like, rooting for it to go over the wall and cheering for home runs. I mean, that's not really the way to do it. Sterling's way old school. He wouldn't go that way there. So... So that's Stern Sterling's and 36 uh, seasons in the in the um, Yankee broadcast booth. Uh, pretty much been my whole Yankee, you know, obviously it's, you know, I've been a, a little live a little longer than 89 there, but pretty much my whole life listening to John Stern there. So a chunk of my, you know, obviously Yankee fandom taken out there as well as every other Yankee fan there. So uh, kind of a sad thing. Uh, I wish you at least maybe tried this one more season because, you know, Obviously, we'll get into the team itself, but maybe this could be a special run here with Soto. Then it'd be nice for him to be around if the Yankees do maybe make a World Series appearance and, you know, even pass win it maybe. You'd like Sterling to be there. Uh, I don't think that's Sterling giving any indication whether he believes in his team or not. Again, I frankly just believe what I said. He was just tired. He had enough. Well, Aaron Judge didn't certainly send Sterling out in style in the so-called 420 game. Again, that was the Aaron Judge bobblehead game slash 
you know, tribute to John Sterling game. And in that game, uh, Aaron Judge went 0 for 4. Again, the Yankees lost the game 2-0. Only good from that was he had a good start from Nestor Cortez, who's kind of hasn't had a great start to the season, but again, had a solid start. But, but unfortunately, the Yankee offense, and of course, you know, maybe the center of that, the captain, Aaron Judge, not off to a good start so far. And a bit of a funk. Went 0 for 4 in that game and actually heard some boos from the Yankee Stadium crowd. And at least up to this point right now, this moment, uh, you know, I was reading this, only hitting 174. Just the three home runs. So, yeah, he's cracked a couple of home runs, 11 RBIs and one stolen bases. But, again, Aaron Judge had not looked like himself at all. I know he had that big hit, and that was the finale game in Toronto. Got that big hit that put the Yankees ahead, and they win the game. That was for the comeback when they were down 0-4. So, yes, good little spot there. But, overall, you know, Aaron Judge has been disappointing, and you kind of worried about him a little bit, mainly because if you're going to go back to spring training, remember he had to be shut down a little bit. He had the quote-unquote core issue. Uh, they had to do an MRI on his abs, and, you know, they had to shut him down a little bit. Then he ramped it up a little bit, and we didn't hear any stories about that. You didn't hear any complaints of injuries or anything like that. But if you look at the, you know, his stats there, hey, look, this hasn't been good. So something's wrong with him. Now, um, if it's physical, I mean, at least at this point, they haven't said anything like that. You haven't you know, had any ter- talk of MRI or anything like that or reports of, of judge complaining of soreness. So it could be this uh, position, uh, situation where, hey, look, he's just starting the season a bit of a funk. He's going to turn around. I think it would as long as he's not hurt. Uh, but it is kind of concerning because I don't know if we've seen We've never seen a healthy judge this bad this long. Uh, only maybe when he first came up, you know, back in 2016, they like, you know, he, he hit like a, far, a home run his first at bat, and after that, that he kind of struggled a little bit. Uh, but, but, but other than that, we really haven't seen judge, at least a healthy judge, struggle this long. So it does matter, you know, give you a little bit of concern there, and you have to look back when we went back in the spring there when he did have that core issue. Is this a carryover from that? Or is this a situation where since he was shut down a little bit, he had kind of had a little delayed to getting a swing down and everything. But we're kind of really, you know, almost done with April at this point. You think, you know, he'd ready to have all that down. He'd kind of be, you know, have his swing and everything. And he would start to be in a groove. But that hasn't been the case. Now, overall, it hasn't hurt the Yankees. Again, overall, you would say the Yankees are off to a good start. And a lot of judges, you know, problems have been masked by, of course, the fabulous start by Juan Soto, who's now become really a fan favorite. I mean, you hear the MVP chants uh, in the crowd this early in the season. We'll kind of get into him a little bit later on. And, of course, the surprising uh, good play and hitting of Oswaldo Cabrera, as well as Anthony Volpe. And even got to give a kudos to John. Um, Gio Carlos Stanton, um, again, got into off a little bit better start than I expected. Again, I was hard on him. He got off to a cold start, but he eventually picked it up, especially during that Toronto series when the Yankees were home. And actually, his grand slam that he crushed in that final game against Toronto, that was officially John Sterling's last, I guess, a Yankee home run call there. So I guess, you know, the feather and cap there for Stanton. So I guess mainly Soto and Stanton, at least the power they've been providing, have masked up because the lack of production from Judge here. So that's why it hasn't seemed too detrimental. Uh, but again, you're still concerned because it's Aaron Judge. Yeah, I mean, he's the captain and stuff, and you can't have a situation where the fans are booing you. They kind of asked Judge about that. He kind of just shrugged it off. And, you know, as a captain, you know, you, have to, you always have to give the right answer. He did. He said, look, if I was one of those fans, I'd be doing the same thing. In fact, I'd even be harsher on myself there. So I think Judge would be okay there, but you got to be concerned. I just hope it has nothing to do with, you know, those core issues he had back in spring. Um, you know, you know, you, you got this offense, you know, it needs to get it rolling a little bit. You know, I know they've Overall, they've been much better than last season. Again, they've been hitting running with scoring position. Uh, you know, so they have been relying on home run, but we have seen a number of games where they've been completely flat, even like Soto been flat there. So you want to get a little more consistency. I think they'll be better. Not only Aaron Judge, but Gleyber Torres, I'll get to in a second, as well as Anthony Rizzo. Even those three have been hitting it. So the only good news is that at some point, I think they will. So there's a lot to expect from this Yankee team. Uh, but again, Judge the captain has to get it going. Whereas I'm not really worried about Judge, as long as no injuries there. But I would be worried about Gleyber Torres because in his situation, I don't think it's any injury related. It could just be, I don't know, he just maybe stinks or really getting off to a bad start there. Um, at this moment there, just reading this, um, hitting 197 right now with zero home runs. And has actually had a long streak of going back to 40-something games even from last season. He has yet to hit a home run there. So I think, again... I don't think he'll be, he's going to be this bad. Uh, but Gleyber Torres, you would think he would get off to a better start just for the fact that he is trying to play for a contract. He does want to be with the Yankees' plans for the long term there. So right now at this point in 2024, not giving the greatest first impression. I was kind of, you know, Gleyber Torres, look, I, I think, he, you know, it he he was good during that Houston series and some spots he has been okay here early on. But again, 
really been in a, in a cold streak lately. And in the last YouTube episode, at least, I did mention at some point, you're probably gonna see Volpe take his job. I didn't think it'd be this soon because I thought, I assume Glebo would start hitting eventually, but he really still hasn't. Uh, so yes, he eventually did lose his hit off, uh, uh, leading, uh, lead off role, uh, hitting role to Glebo, uh, to Anthony Volpe there. So Glebo now gone down in the, in the, in the, in the batting order a little bit, as well as even lost the start in that same Saturday game against Tampa Bay. Actually, the start went to, uh, uh, Jemiah Jones there. Now, according to Aaron Boone, it had nothing to do with, with uh, Glabar's uh, performance. It was more that he just wanted to get Jones a start just to you know, just throw him out there as a starter. Now, later in that game, Glabar Torres would pinch hit, so he didn't totally bench Glabar Torres there. But I think it is Boone, in a way, you know, firing a warrant and shot at him a little bit because at some point he has to get it going here. Uh, but again, kind of like Aaron Judge hitting on the 200 there, I think he will eventually get a little bit better there. Now, according to Aaron Boone, he says he's just missing on some pitches there that normally he would hit there. So even Aaron Boone express shock that he's been this bad there um but again i just have mixed feelings about glaber torres i really think going to go back to this past off season that's probably when his stock was highest if you're going to make a move for him i mean he just came in second uh, at least for the silver slugger for second baseman hitting there um you know put up some decent numbers i know a lot batting average wise a little bit low but power and doubles and home runs was decent there for a second baseman you could possibly have made a move for him at this time but at this point right now if he kind of continues trend or even if he gets a little bit better his value of what you could get if you want to package him to maybe get another starter or maybe you know get bringing another you know eight uh, you know top flight bullpen relief arm in here well that's going to go out the window there if he doesn't improve there and of course he doesn't play well at all i don't think the yankees are going to have him in their long-term plans now overall um you know i don't think the Yankees are going to go with him long term just i don't think he seems to be a keeper in that regard but again he is better than this we've seen him better than this but right now it's very putrid uh, and he needs to get uh, pick it up there a little bit um and again hopefully boone's right where he's just missing a little bit we've seen some yankees improve because again um, even verdugo didn't get, get off to the greatest of start but really he said that home run in um in Arizona there, kind of made him to trust his swing a little bit more. So maybe this Glaber Torres needs that big home run, a big hit to sort of get his back going there. Hopefully that's the case there. But um, again, kind of concerned about Glaber a little bit. Um, you know, I think he'll be better than this. But overall, after this season, I do not see him in a Yankee uniform. And staying on the Yankee infield, DJ LeMayo making his way back to the team, starting a rehab assignment. Now, back on April 18th, they did an MRI on that uh, uh, fracture in the foot. Now, supposedly... Uh, it hasn't healed the way doctors have been, so you think that's maybe bad news, but actually they are going forward on the 21st. Boone announced that on April 23rd, uh, DJ May will start a rehab assignment. Now, according to DJ, he only needs about five games, so it looks like maybe a quick turnaround of only one week. Now, he has been running, he's been taking fielding drills, he's been uh, taking batting practice, and according to him, he's not experiencing any pain or any issues, so even though the, you know, it hasn't healed according to the MRI, he still feels he's good to go for baseball, uh, to stop, you know, playing baseball uh, already so I'll say that's a, that's a good point. We'll see, see what he can bring to the table there. Now, there was some talk that when he is ready, that you know he's going to be the de facto leadoff hitter. I don't think that's good news at all. I mean, Anthony Volpe, even though he's in a mini slump a little bit in the last couple of games, um, Volpe's been hitting well since spring out of the out of the gate here. It's been really great for the Yankees overall. And, you know, I don't think it's really like, you know, DJ, even though DJ's been here for a couple of seasons, I don't think it's just because DJ's back, he automatically becomes now the leadoff hitter there. So I think DJ has to earn that um, that opportunity there. So if they want to so put DJ down, you know, hit sixth or seventh, and if he hits well, then he can work his way up into Volpe, maybe gets to a cold streak, then maybe do the switch. But there's the fact that DJ walks in the door and now he's the de facto, um, you know, leadoff hitter. I don't think that's right because I don't think he's earned it. Um, you know, he hasn't been good the past couple of seasons. And let's be frank, he's not Derek Jeter. As we know, remember Derek Jeter, yeah, he was playing shortstop, leading off. Now, the past two or three last final seasons for Derek Jeter weren't pretty. He wasn't the same hitter. Normally, he should have been lead, leading off at that point. But at that point, Point, he's Derek Jeter. I mean, he's Mr. Yankee. He earned that respect where even if he doesn't deserve to be there, you still put him near there because and, and it's not worth it because the Yankee, those couple Yankees team the last few years weren't good at all. So it wasn't like he was costing you a playoff opportunity like that. Like DJ, uh, Derek Jeter in that position earned that. For DJ LeMayu to come back and sort of, well, now I'm the lead of hitter because I'm here. That's not the case. DJ LeMayu and Derek Jeter. Again, I like DJ. He's okay. He's done some you know, good stuff here early on when he came to the Yankees. But lately hasn't been the case. And again, he does not have the resume or anything like Derek Jeter where he walks in the door. And now he's the de facto lead off hitter there. So if he comes back and he's healthy and contributes, great. I would put him maybe, hit him six, hit him seven down there in the lineup a little bit. Let him get some you know, maybe easier pitches than you would a lead off hitter there. And if he gets hot and, and 
proves that he can be a, you know, a good steady uh, hitter like he kind of was when he first came to the Yankees, they'll say, by all means, put him up there in front of Soto and Judge, and that should be good for the Yankee offense. But he has to earn that end or Volpe has to really fall off the ledge there for that to happen. But for DJ to walk in the door, I don't think it's the case. So we'll see how the rehab goes. Hopefully, you know, he doesn't further injure that, uh, further, you know, increase that fracture or anything like that. And, um, you know, it just gives the Yankees yet another option there. Uh, again, if, if DJ's on his, on his game and, you know, contributing the way you know, Stanton's had a bit of a, a renaissance so far this season, and if DJ could do the same thing, all the more better for the Yankee offense. And Cole is also working his way back. Now the Yankees are hoping by early May he could throw off a slope, so it's kind of like mimicking throwing off a mound. And then I guess, you know, you better have a month, a month and a half from there, and then finally he could join the Yankee rotation. Again, good news overall, the Yankee rotation has been desperately needing him. Again, Luis Heald been, you know, fabulous to start the season. Again, you know, probably a little better than we expected. Clark Schmidt's been decent. Rondon Nestor, I know Nestor had a few clunkers there. But overall, the Yankee starting rotation is good enough where you don't need to rush Cole back. Uh, but hopefully, again, he's back by at least a June timetable. And moving back up into the broadcast booth, I guess, you know, maybe the new de facto voice of the Yankees, which would be, I guess, Michael Kay, just because now Sterling's not there anymore, and kind of Kay's the kind of second guy that's been here, here uh, pretty much, even though Kay's been, you know, reporting on the Yankees since 87, but nevertheless made a comment on a recent Yankee broadcast, and this when the Yankees were in Toronto. Kind of mentioned how the uh, Toronto Blue Jays, are, at least the hitters, are a much better or different team than the, the, than what the Yankees face when the, you know when, the, when they visit the Yankee Stadium. More that they foul more balls off, they grinded. I mean, they made his calls run don't work much very hard there. So Kay was kind of speculating a bit: is there something going on? And this goes back to maybe a couple of, you know several years. I even remember Joe Girardi complained about. I guess then it was the Sky Dome before it came to Rogers Center. You know, obviously you know out there on the outfield they have all those hotels and restaurants. There's a lot of windows out there, and potentially is there someone going out there with a, with a telescope? Or something like you know the situation that we saw back you know in Houston a couple of seasons ago with that whole scandal. So Kay, Kay putting it out there a little bit again. You, the the Toronto Blue Jay hitters are much more disciplined, much more grind out batch at home versus they on the road there. So look, the numbers do back it up a little bit. Now this is just 20 games in. But again, this is at home. The Blue Jays are hitting 279 versus on the road 193. So they hit 80 points better at home versus on the road. Now look. There's familiarity with the stadium, there's home cooking, all those things, all the intricacies have something to do with it. But again, that's an 80 point difference there in the batting average and OPS um, at home, 7.756, uh, on the road, 627. Uh, so about 130, uh, 130 OPS better at home versus on the road there. So again, those numbers, at least hitting wise, may, you know, make a case there. And if you want to look at the record, again, this is the 20 games in, there's 6 and 3 at home. So it's three games over 500 at home and five and six on the road. So one game below 500 on the road there. So if you want to just look at those numbers itself, look, they, they seem to obviously be a much more winning and better hitting team at home versus on the road. And now, are they cheating? Are they stealing signs, anything like that? I don't know. And these two organizations have been going back a couple, uh, you know, fourth over the past few years, a little bit rivalry there. We know the whole thing with Manoa versus Cole. Remember the thing with Judge last season when he kind of peeked over the third baseman there before I think a home run in Toronto and they accused the Yankees of stealing signs there. So it seems like there's both these organizations are throwing bobs back at each other, but that's on the field. But here's Michael Kay making a conjecture uh, in the broadcast booth. And at least with the numbers wise, it kind of makes sense. So we don't know if Major League Baseball is going to investigate the Toronto Blue Jays, but they have made a ruling on Nesta Cortez, you know, infamously how he does his delayed, you know, pump fakes and leg kicks and stuff before throwing a ball there. It's entertaining, but the one he did in Cleveland, if you caught it, he made kind of a fake throw towards home, then put the ball in it got the ball for real, and then threw it in there. Uh, now, the ball ended up getting fouled off, but Major League Baseball said, according to the rules, that should actually have been called a ball there. So, now, is this a foul tip at there at the time? But if he does it again, Major League Baseball has said the umpire's going to call that a ball. And I guess we'll end it with Juan Soto, who I thought when he came here would just be a one-year rental, but you see the way it's going so far, the fan reaction as well as Brian Cashman saying he would like to have Soto in the long-term Yankee plans there. So, a little hesitant. I don't think the Yankees are going to you know, give him a, a 10 or 12 year deal, which he'll probably command. But at age 25, even if they did, you'd have until 37, which isn't crazy. And if he continues on this way, maybe he'll be a Yankee for life. So that's the episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Again, farewell to John Sterling. Hope he enjoys his retirement. Uh, hopefully he doesn't stay too far from the Yankee family and we see him again maybe making some spot starts. Now make sure you subscribe to all the platforms I mentioned earlier. And that's a wrap.